with it. All right, so the recorder is on. And the audio is good. And I'm on the right screen. Okay, so I'm just double checking everything uh, to make sure that the recording, the recording is, is good. All right, so this is the homework assignment that I have been talking about, you know, since <clears throat> last week. So what I want you guys to do is to write a program that will print out lotto tickets to win a particular prize. Okay, so let me describe the whole thing, and then if you guys have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to raise your hand and let me know. All right, so the program has uh, input and output. So the input is completely just coming from standard in. So that means in C++ programming, you can use C in. And then the output is completely using standard out. So that means you can use C out in C++ for this particular program. The input has three lines of uh, integers. You don't really need to make sure that they are on three separate lines, you know, because you know, when you C in into an unsigned integer, it will automatically skip spaces and also line feed automatically. So whether it is a line feed or whether it's a space really should not make any difference. So the first line is going to have two unsigned integers you know, separated by spaces. Uh, the first number or the first unsigned integer is the upper bound of the five winning numbers. So typically in a normal Powerball game, they would use 69 as the upper bound. So that means, you know, it would uh, be the game will choose five numbers from 1 to 69 in the normal game. But when you're debugging this program and you are using 69 numbers to choose from, it's very difficult to check your answer. So that's why, you know, I want it to be programmable, you know, so that the upper bound of the first five numbers or how you choose the first five number can be, you know, um, specified using the first number of the first line. Is that okay so far? So that means if you change, if you specify 15, that means you know, the first, the five numbers will be choosing from one to 15 inclusively, okay? <clears throat> the second number of the first line is going to be the Powerball, the upper bound of the Powerball number. So once again, in the actual lotto game, the upper bound is 26. But if you use 26, you know, you're going to have to go through a lot of printout just to make sure that your program is working correctly. So you can change this upper bound from 26 down to a much more manageable number, like 5, okay? Because in that case, you have one single Powerball number that matches, and then only four numbers that do not match, okay? That makes debugging your program a whole lot easier, okay? So those are the reasons why I want these two numbers to be programmable because you know, for, from the perspective of debugging, reducing these upper bounds you know, to a manageable you know, uh, range makes it much easier to debug the program. The second line has the actual five winning numbers separated by spaces and then followed by the Powerball number, which is also spaced up by a, a single space. And then the third line has two unsigned integers, and that one specifies you know, what qualifies as the prize that we are looking for. The first integer is the number of winning numbers to match out of the five you know, of the numbers that are chosen. And then the second one is a zero if and only if the Powerball number is not to be matched. Okay, so do we have any questions about you know, all this description here? I have examples. Yes? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yes, I am recording. Yep, it's good to double check. Thank you. Okay, any questions? I have examples, so that hopefully that will help understand you know, what that means. So in this particular example, you know, I use 10 and 10 to specify the upper bound of both the five numbers to be uh, chosen, and then also as the upper bound of the Powerball number. They do not have to be the same, okay? So once again, you know, these are just randomly chosen numbers. On the second number, on the second line, this is the actual result of the drawing. So one, two, five, seven, eight are the five drawn numbers, you know, for the first five numbers of the ticket, and then the six is the Powerball number. So if somebody you know gets this particular ticket, that person would have won the jackpot of the Powerball lotto. Is that okay? Does everybody understand how the five numbers and the plus the Powerball number are specified? 
Okay. And then the third line is specifying what kind of a prize or what kind of a lotto ticket we're trying to generate. So in this case, I want to generate all the lotto tickets that has five of the numbers matching these five here. Three of, excuse me, excuse me, three of these five numbers matching, and then the other two would be you know from one to ten, but not matching these five numbers. And then the zero specifies that I do not want to match the Powerball number. Is that okay? So as an example, okay, this is the output of one of the tickets. The five numbers on the ticket are you know, specified as a set, so you have to use curly braces you know, to enclose you know, those five numbers. And then within the curly braces, you know, they have to be comma separated. And then outside of the curly brace, we have a comma separating the Powerball number from the rest of the first five numbers. So is the format okay? Does everybody understand the format of the output? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so here are some restrictions. The program should be written in C++ or Java because you know, I do understand that some people in this class are from Sac State, so those people may not be as uh, proficient with C++ as people who take the you know, CISP 430 you know, from ARC. So it can be written in, in C++ or Java without the use of any library slash class slash template that implements you know, um, com combinatorics. <clears throat> if I were to write this program in JavaScript using the combinatorics you know, module, it would be almost trivial to write that program. But, that, but then where's the fun in doing that, right? I mean, there, there, won't, be, there won't be any fun in, you know, in do, doing this anymore. So you are restricted to either use C++ or Java. Um, in the submitted program, the input and output should match the specifications exactly. If you rely on C out to debug your program, not exactly the most efficient way to debug a program, instead of using C out, use C log instead. Have you ever been introduced to the other two standard output files in C++ and also in C? Okay, so there are four of them, okay? So there are actually four files that are available for you to write to. Oh, well, okay, three to write to, one to read from. The one to read from is easy. That's C in, okay, in C++. There are three output files. One is C out, which all of you know. The other two, one is called C er, C, and then ERR, you know, for the error file. And then the other one is called C log for a log file. So from the command line perspective, I can log, I can capture just C out, and then I can divert your C er and C log to um, the null device, therefore ignoring that. So that means if you want to use you know, the C out approach of debugging a program, you're printing out, okay, what is this variable having right now, and so on and so forth, instead of sending the debug message to C out, send those to C log instead. Is that okay, or do you guys want me to show you an example? An example? Okay, example it is. I'm just double checking, make sure it's still recording. All right, so I can show you an example. Let me pick a, a command line that is, <clears throat> okay, I'll pick this one and give me a second to bring it over here. Okay, so I just called it C, uh, log.cpp, which is a C++ program. So I have to include, is it IO stream to include um, C in and C out? You can see that I don't write C++ programs that much. So there we go. And then you can just do a C standard C log and then give it like, is a task. <clears throat> okay. G plus plus dash G dash O C log C log dot CPP and then run the program. Come on. There we go. Just like that. So the so you can look up the file number. So in case you're debugging your program, um you can capture one but not the other one into a file, or you can capture those into separate files. 
So I can run this program, okay? And the redirection symbol, which is just the greater than symbol, is applicable only to standard output, okay? So I'm running this, capturing the standard output to a file. I'm just gonna call this log, okay? And you can see that, hey, it's not capturing it because you know, this output here is not being sent to standard output, it's being sent to the log, which has a different file number. So now I can you know, run the program again. This time I specified two you know, greater than, and that is being sent to the log file. So that means you know, if you want to use you know, the, um, the usual C out method for debugging a program, you can sprinkle all that stuff okay, in this program, just do not send those to standard output. As you, if you send it to standard error, if you send it to you know, the log file, it's going to be okay. Okay, the output should only contain the ticket descriptions. Is that part okay? All right. All right. So that's it. Okay. So that's basically what your program is supposed to do. And in this case, in this particular example, this is one of the output of this many potential outputs. So we are looking at your know, five choose three times five choose two times nine. So that's the total number of lines of output in this particular case. When I set the upper bound of the five numbers you know, to be chosen to 10, I also set you know, 10 as the upper bound of the um, Powerball number. Um, and I want to have three matching out of the five you know, uh, drawn numbers, you know, one, two, five, seven, one, two, five, seven, and eight are the one are the winning numbers. I want three of those and two of the non-winning numbers. And I also do not want the Powerball number to match. And since there are 10 numbers to choose from, one is the actual Powerball number. And that's why we have 10 minus one, which is a nine as part of the multiplication. All right, are we doing okay so far or not? Okay. Just really quick, what is five choose two? In other words, what is combin five three? So to answer that question, there are several levels to the, to the answer to that question. The one is, do you remember the equation to figure out you know, n choose m? Yes, no, maybe, no. no. How can it be a no? We have been talking about this since, co since I got COVID. <laughs> okay, so let's, <coughs> I'm only half kidding you. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at, okay, file, new, there we go. So combin nm, okay, which means you're out of n, we choose m. That is defined to be n factorial divided by, and you know, the denominator is going to have n minus m, the whole thing factorial, and also m factorial. But this is introduced in one of the modules, you know, that talks about, you know, why that is the case. Yes, go ahead. So couldn't we, like, you know, just recall, you know, for example, the first one, you know, we just had it from the first like, for factorial. Well, but I'm not asking you for the number of tickets. I'm asking you to print the actual tickets. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so let's go back to the example that we were looking at earlier, which is you know, just based on this particular assumption. So another ticket that would also match you know, this particular description here is going to be uh, two, okay, in braces, you know, two, five, eight, and then I just have to pick two numbers that are not part of the winning numbers. Uh, three is not a winning number, and neither is nine, you know, a winning number. So that would be okay as the five numbers, because out of the five, three are matching the winning numbers. And then for the Powerball number, I do not want to match, because, you know, this particular zero here tells me that I do not want to match the Powerball number. The actual Powerball number is a six, so that means anything from one to 10, but not six is gonna be okay. So I can pick seven, is that okay? So this is, the, this is another ticket that can meet all the criteria based on this particular input 
to the program. So your program is going to give me, you know, five choose three times five choose two times nine of those tickets, and they all should be different. Okay, but just to give us a scale of what we are talking about, so combin you know, five three is basically five factorial divided by two factorial times three factorial. So that is 120 divided by 2 times 6, and that is basically just 10. And 5 choose 2 is the same value, so that means we have 10 times 10, which is 100, times 9, so that makes 900. So based on this particular input here, I should be seeing 900 tickets as the output. There should be 900 tickets matching this description. Go ahead. Sorry? We want the all, uh, <clears throat> all of them. Yep, the program should print every single one. So the output on each line in the set notation indicate you know, the five numbers on the ticket, comma separated inside the braces, then a comma, and then followed by the Powerball number of the same ticket. The output should include all tickets to win the specific prize. And of course, I'm not going to grade this by hand. I have my program to do all the grading. Yes. So that's to fix that input. Mm -hmm. The first 10 and the second 10 get specified the last one to. The upper bounds, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, so the, and then the second line, so where you're inputting the number of tickets. The actual what? jackpot ticket. Mm -hmm. So what, the, what's the bottom two? Three? What is? The three and the zero? The three and the zero. Yeah. So the three means you know I want each ticket to match only three out, out, out of the five winning numbers. And the zero means I do not want to match the Powerball number. So if I want to match the Powerball number, then there's only one choice for the Powerball number, which in this case is the six. However, since I do not want to match, so that means you know, anything from one to 10 other than six is going to be able to, is part of the ticket. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. <clears throat> yep. So, uh that would not be included because if your ticket has one two five seven nine then yeah. you have you're matching four of the five yeah. winning numbers okay so you don't want anything above that you just don't want to get the it's exactly that number okay yep mm -hmm. and this number the three can be all the way down to zero which means I want a ticket that is not matching any of the five winning numbers. Oh, just taking the mic. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> All right. Um, okay, you first, and then you uh, second. Go ahead. Yeah, so the input is from standard input. Yeah. Okay. So one thing you can do to help you know, speed up the whole process is to type these three lines here and put it into a text file. Then you can redirect that text file into your program, you know, depending on which debugger you're using. Um, that way you don't have to retype you know, these uh, digits, you know, these numbers over and over again. So that's one way to help you know, speed up the, the whole process. But you have, to be, you have to know how to use your debugger um, the way VS Code may specify the standard input file may be different from your know, code blocks, which is different from just using GDB itself. So you have to know the uh, debugging environment well enough to kind of streamline the process. All right, anything else? Yep. So for the input, <clears throat> if I have one cell, zero, that's good. So if I have one cell, so the output we have only one line, right? Because that's the only what? Say that one more time. So for the input, we have it, one would not be a good input. Okay, you know, if this is a one, that would not be uh, good. Yeah, the third line, the third three, line, you mean yeah, here? Yeah. Like the same mm -hmm. zero with one, then there has to be a winning number. So on the third line, if it is a five followed by a non-zero, then there should be only one single ticket. That would be the jackpot ticket, which is the same as what is on the second line. Right. But the formatting would be different because you need to put curly braces around the first five numbers comma separating it, and then have a comma after the closed brace, and then the six. So if I have 
three and then one, that would not be a valid input. Say again? So if I have three and then one. On the third line? Yeah, yeah. That would you can be. have that. I mean, you know, a three, one would make um, like one, two, five, three, four, six, you know, a, you know, a ticket. Because you know a three one means you know I need to match three out of the five winning numbers, but I also want to match the Powerball number, which in this case is a six. This six here specifies the Powerball number of the jackpot ticket. Okay. Any questions? So if you put a one instead of the zero, so that it matches the Powerball number. Mm -hmm. that, in, that also means the ticket still only has to have three numbers match. Okay, so let's take that in a, as a consideration. So, um, so we, do you want to change the uh, the first the upper bounds as an example? Okay, so we, we'll keep the same. Okay, so we'll keep the same upper bound as ten and ten. Uh, we'll keep we'll keep the same your know, jackpot your know, ticket. So the one, two, five, seven, eight are the winning numbers, and then we have a Powerball number of six. Now remember, the Powerball number is completely independent to the five numbers you know, prior to the Powerball number, so it can be one of those five numbers as well. Okay, so do not there, there are no relationships whatsoever between the five winning numbers and the Powerball number. So if I specify a three and a one, so now if I look at the possible output, um, I can have um, eight, okay, in braces, eight, seven, one, and then now have to pick your two non-winning numbers, uh, four, three, six, ten, those are all non-winning numbers, there should be five you know, non-winning numbers, so I'm going to pick uh, six, five, oh, nope, six, and a four, okay, as my non-winning numbers, and, but this time, because there's a one right here, that means you know my ticket has to match the the Powerball number, which in this case is a six. So that becomes a possible output. Now because the, this is a set notation, so that means you know all the numbers, all the values within the braces do not need to be sorted in any particular way. So this is this is perfectly okay. But you don't want to regenerate the same ticket twice as the output. So every ticket should only be output once, you know, from your program. Yes? So that means that, <clears throat> so like you just said, that if you have like, you have that ticket on screen, but if you have something else that has like three numbers in it, it's like at least off order, you have to ignore just that, right? That is correct. But de depending on how you organize your program, you know, the elimination of duplication can be almost automatic. Because numbers or unsigned numbers are uh, totally ordered, so that means you know, there's a quick and easy way to make sure that you only print the numbers in a particular way, then there won't be any duplicate tickets. So, like, if you have so, so let me write it do not also output. You know, another one, which is basically the same thing, except everything seems to be sorted. So one, four, six, seven, eight, and then followed by a six. You do not want you know, have to have this output and this output at the same time because they are really the same ticket because of the set notation. Is that okay? All right, cool. All right, so yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> how to calculate um, how many uh, tickets are printed because um, obviously you get a response from Karma. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which numbers do you, do you put in that function to figure out how many tickets are printed? Aha, okay. So we talked about um, lotto tickets you know, and counting of the lotto tickets. And I believe, I cannot remember which day we talked about it, but there was a discussion, you know, probably you. It's harder to remember when I'm not interactively teaching and I'm just talking to the screen. Um, so the idea, okay, in a, in a normal lotto game, okay, in a normal lotto Powerball <clears throat> game. 
So let's just say that I want to, okay, let, let's make this more realistic and we go to a specific price money that we are looking for. Okay, so we go to uh, California. I mean, it's the same nationwide, you know, but I'm used to you know, that particular website. So we're going to go there. So the Powerball, and then we look at uh, specific prices. <clears throat> okay, how to play game odds, past winning numbers. There we go. Okay, so let's just say that, you know, this is the drawing that we are talking about. So these five numbers are the quote unquote winning numbers, and this is the Powerball number. Are we good so far? So let's just say that I'm very specific about which price or what price money we're talking about, and I just want to uh, get seven dollars, you know, back after I spend two dollars to buy a ticket. So we we will be focusing on this particular row, which means out of the five winning numbers, I want to match exactly three. The Powerball number is not supposed to be matched because if I match the Powerball number. I'll be you know winning one hundred thirty seven dollars instead of just seven dollars. So, and the question is, how many tickets will meet will match this description? So the way we do that calculation is, um, <clears throat> so we have you know combed in you know five three of ways to choose three of the five winning numbers. Does that make sense? Okay. But then for each way of choosing three out of the five winning numbers, we also need to choose the non-winning numbers. So the question is, how many ways can we choose the non-winning numbers? Well, it's going to be a combine because your ordering is not important. So the question now is, if I have five winning numbers and there are 69 numbers to choose from, so how many are the non-winning numbers? What is the number of non-winning numbers? 64, very good. Okay, so I'm going to say that as, as 69 minus 5 because, you know, 69 is the total number of possibilities. Of those, 5 are chosen as the uh, winning numbers, so 64 are the non-winning numbers. And remind me again, how many of the non-winning numbers do I need on this ticket? Two, Two okay, but I'm going to say 5 minus 3 because the three is already mentioned here as the number of winning numbers, right? So now we just have to figure out what else do we have to multiply because you know, that this part here took care of the five numbers on the ticket, but it doesn't factor in the Powerball number. So the row that we want does not want to match the Powerball number. So in a real lotto game, the Powerball number is a number chosen from 26. So that leaves me with 25 non-Powerball numbers. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means I have to multiply this by 26 minus 1. So that would be the total number of tickets that will you know, basically give me a price money of a you know, price dollar amount of 7. Does that, is that working okay? Okay, all right, cool. <clears throat> now, how do you know whether you know you are doing the calculations correctly? So what we can do is we can we can actually go through this calculation. Um, and the quickest way to go through the calculation, you know, I you know just like to use a spreadsheet to do it. So I'm just gonna use a spreadsheet, you know, get, give myself a new sheet here. So I'm just gonna type in you know, the, the, the numbers that we just talked about. Uh, out of the five winning numbers, we need three of those to match. Out of the 64 non-winning numbers, we need two of those to match. And then we also need you know, one of the 25 not matching, non-matching Powerball numbers. So we are talking about this number of lotto tickets out of all the total possible tickets to you know, give me seven bucks back after spending two dollars. Is that okay? Now, this by itself is not a probability, okay? This is actually the cardinality of the event set. How many people still remember what is an event set? What does it mean when we say, oh, this is the set of events, or this is the event set? What does each member of the event set represent? <clears throat> 
Each element in the event set is representing a outcome of the experiment that is of interest to us. Now, why is it of interest to us? Well, that depends on the context. So in this case, I just want to know what is the probability of me you know, getting $7 back after spending $2, okay? That's the only reason. Is that okay? All right, so this is basically the cardinality of the event set. So now we have to look at the cardinality of the uh, big omega set, which is you know, all the possible things, all the possible tickets. So do you remember how to calculate the number of all, the total number of possible tickets according to the Powerball uh, rule of gain? Okay. Because that was one of the first things that we talked about when we got into discrete probability, because I thought most people may be interested in the odds of you know, getting a lotto ticket or winning the lotto, so that you, don't, you won't have to be in this class anymore. It's like, I'm all set for life, until the IRS contacts you. It's like, oh, okay. by the way, you still owe us this much money. You go like, no, no, I spent all that money already. I cannot pay my taxes anymore. <clears throat> okay, so how did we do this calculation? The way we did, we did this calculation is we have 69 numbers to begin with. We have to choose five of those as our lucky, uh, as our winning numbers. And then we also have um, 26 uh, possible Powerball numbers. So we multiply that by 26. So that is, you know, basically close to two, 300 million. Okay, do you guys vaguely remember this discussion? I remember the, in the video I was using a tree representation to look at this. Yes, okay. Okay, so let me just say this, okay? You know, I know it does not apply to most people. I would, I would certainly hope that it applies to no one in this class. If you have not watched the recording that I did over the past two weeks, it's probably a good idea to catch up with the videos first, okay? But I'm hoping that I'm talking to an empty set. <laughs> hey, a professor can keep hoping, right? <clears throat> so now the question is, what is the probability? Okay, you know, if I spend two bucks on a lottery ticket, what is the probability that I will get exactly $7 back? So that becomes just a ratio of this number divided by this number here, and that's the probability, which is 0.17%. Okay, so you guys look at this number and go like, okay, but tech, you can just write any number on the, you know, on the spreadsheet, and we cannot tell whether that really is the case or not. So what we do is we go to the lotto website, and double check because the lotto website by law is required to disclose the odds of winning. So we go to up here, game odds, okay, and then we just look up you know, any three of five. So the odd of winning is one of one in 580. And I can tell you right away that this sounds about right, okay, <clears throat> because according to the spreadsheet, we are looking at 0.17 of a percent. So there are about five of these, you know, five to six-ish of these in 1%, right? And then they're 100% in one. So when you multiply five-ish, you know, close to six, you know, by 100, we get about, guess what? Close to 600. So, but we can double check on that number. We can say, you know, what is the reciprocal of this number here? And that's, that's where they got the 580. All right, so does that help jog you know, any memory that we have already talked about this? Okay, excellent. <clears throat> and I believe that I even talked about you know, why in this particular you know, website, instead of giving people the actual probability, they mentioned what is the odds of one in something. Because you know, when you look at one in close to 300 million, that number is very small, okay? So the question is, how small of a number are we talking about? Why is it difficult for a normal person to perceive that particular value? 
So let's go ahead and check that. Okay, so we go to the spreadsheet again. <clears throat> and this time we just say, you know, one divided by about 300 million. Okay, that is the value. Okay, in other words, if the website is to publish this, you know, as the chances of winning the jackpot number, I don't think it's going to register in most people's mind of you know, what that number is really representing. So that's why, you know, one in 300 million, yeah, sounds a whole lot more perceivable. But in reality, it's not. Just look at how many people play the lotto game and you will realize that people don't really understand what is one in 300 million. <clears throat> but I really cannot complain because part of that money becomes my salary. So if I teach this class really well, I won't have a job anymore. You guys know that, right? The Lotto Fund, you know, is also used partially to fund community colleges. Which is interesting because if I do an excellent job teaching you know, math and probabilities and whatnot, I just cut off the funding to my own salary. <clears throat> Cool. All right. So do we understand what the homework assignment is about? Okay. All right. So I got some hints. Okay. Because I know, you know, when people look at this program, it's like, uh, how do we do this? Right. You know, because C and C++, you know, they, it doesn't really have a representation of a set. Now, yes, I know that we have a template class called a set. You can use that. Okay. That is not considered a combinatoric, you know, class. So you can use the class you know, for you know, for a set, but I think that's overcomplicating things quite a bit. Okay, so you can actually write the code in a much simpler way, without really having to resort to the concept of a set. Yes, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Correct. That is correct. So internal to your program, you can con you can implement a set as an array of integers if you want to. And if you want to, you can also use an array of sorted integers if that is also, you know, if that's going to be helpful. So how you implement, you know, the program is up to you. I only look at the output of your program to see if it contains every single ticket that should be included but no duplicates in the output. That okay? All right. So <clears throat> let me go back to the description of the homework assignment because you know I got some restrictions that I need to talk about. Uh, the biggest one I talked about already, which is you know basically without the use of any library slash class slash template that implements combinatorics. And I would know if there is such a thing because you know, it would be very clear that there's a pound include of a header file that has something to do with combinatorics. Or in the case of Java, you know, it would also you know, make sure that uh, uh, when I run it, you know, it would also require a special um, library you know, to run. So I would know. <clears throat> um, the submission should be a single source file that compiles in C++ or Java. So that means you know, that's your programming language um, limitation. It's either C++ or Java. And there are hints. Because the, up, the upper bounds are relatively low, you can use a regular array of unsigned integers to implement a set. Now, you might say, but you know, in an array, you know, things are ordered. That is true, okay? But the program really doesn't care how a set is actually implemented in the back end. So you can choose whatever way that is the most convenient to implement the program. Okay, and using an array is a quick and easy way to do it. <clears throat> um, and also because zero is not a valid member in a set, because remember, we start the numbers from one. So if you use the typical rule of a lotto game, the number, the first five numbers can be from one to 69, which means zero can be now used as a null terminator if you have an array that needs to be 
of a varying size, then you can use a null terminator to say, oh, this is the end of the whole thing. So this way you don't have to pass the length of the array around you know, as much. <clears throat> Um, unsigned integers are totally ordered, so you can use this to your advantage to make the algorithm very efficient, okay? And it will also automatically remove duplicate sets, okay, you know, in the process. A recursive approach is encouraged to generate the number on a ticket. You can parameterize and use the same function to generate the matching and also the non-matching numbers. The program should not need to store each and every single ticket, just the one being generated. So this means you know, we can use a generate and print approach instead of, oh, I'm going to store all the 300 million tickets you know, in memory first before I print it out. No, don't do that, okay? Because you're going to chew up all the memory of your computer, you know, and it's not necessary. You can just you know, basically use a recursive approach to keep generating, and then once you have a ticket generated, print it out, okay? But because it's a recursive approach, so that means you, know, you can backtrack to the previous invocation and see if there are alternatives to generate another ticket that also match all the descriptions. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. <clears throat> um, the program can be implemented with great efficiency in plain C. If you're contemplating the use of complex data structures, you're probably overthinking. <clears throat> all right. Now, because efficiency is not a part of the grading standard here, you can really use a generate and test approach, which is a recursive. I would still use the recursive approach, you know, just because you know that makes it easier to uh, generate all the possible tickets. And then generate and test means you for each ticket possible ticket that you generate, you test to see if it, it matches the criteria the criteria that we have specified. If it matches, print it out. If it doesn't match, don't do a single thing with it. Move on to the next possible ticket. Okay, so that's another approach. It's not quite as efficient as you know, just generating the tickets that match the criteria, but the generate and test approach is conceptually a lot simpler. So how you want to get things done is entirely up to you. I'm just you know, describing general strategies to implement a program like this. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So let me take a look at, you know, let me show you what I mean by, you know, um, a method to generate, you know, things or combinations, but without the need to understand what a set is, okay? So let me just kind of say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, you know, are the ones that I need to choose from. I need to choose three of these things, okay? So what it, one approach is to say, uh, let's pick this, this one here, and then from here we'll pick this one, and then from here we'll pick this one. Oh, I have chosen three already. So one, two, and three is one combination of one, two, three, four, five. And then I do a recursion, you know, go back to the previous step and say, okay, we'll keep these two, but hey, I got another choice for this third one, which is this one here, okay? And then you backtrack again, and then you go like, okay, we can also choose the third one to be the five. So this way, you know, you can generate um, combinations just by recursive calls, and then each recursive call involves a loop of some kind. So when this is all done, then we go back here and say, okay, can this be the second number? Yes. If this is the second number, this can be the third number. And then you go back and then you say, okay, what about you using this as my third number? Yeah, that can work too. When this is all done, then you are basically running out of things to do. When one is the first number, then you move on to two as my first number. This is my first number. What can be my second number? Oh, the one right next to it. What can be my third number? The one right next to it. And then you backtrack and then you ask, can I have a different choice for my third number? Yes, this can be my third number. Do you, do you guys see the approach, more or less? Okay, <clears throat> and that should use up, you know, all the possibilities. I think I'm just looking to. Oh, that's one more. Okay, so I go back here, and I can say, you know, what about the second number being this one? Okay, that's a choice. But if this is my second number. 
this has to be done by, by third number. And then I can look into the possibilities of using you know, the third one as my first number. And I'm missing one combination here. Okay, what, which one is missing? Oh, I know which one is missing. It's all the way back here. This is my first number, and these are my uh, last two numbers. So now I have all 10 combinations. But in a very systematic way, okay? So if you look at this pattern here, and you go like, huh, okay, there's a certain pattern to it. We fix the first one, and then we ask, well, what can be the second one? Oh, I'm just going to be lazy and just say, what about this is just the next one is the second one? After I chose the first, I have chosen the first two, what, is, what can be the third one? Let's just pick whatever is right next to it. That's one combination already. But then you go back and you ask, well, do we have alternatives? Now, remember, each of these carrots is representing one recursive call. So that means the third recursive call can say, hold on a second here. This is not my only choice. I can choose this one too. Or I can choose this one. Okay. At this point, your third recursive call is going, to, is going to say, I have exhausted every single possibility as the third recursive call. So the third recursive call is going to go back to the second recursive call and they ask, okay, I'm responsible for the second number of the combination. I just looked at this as the second possible number. Are there alternatives? Sure, we can move on to this one as the second number. And then goes on again, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but the key is to look at the possibilities in a quote unquote ordered way, even though a set is not supposed to be ordered. But this can really help to reduce the complexity of the recursive algorithm to generate all the uh, combinations without repetition. There's no need to worry about repetition here because of the way the loop goes for each level of the recursion. Are we doing okay so far with this approach? Okay. All right. Any other questions? I think I should make this a homework assignment for my assembly language programming class. <laughs> okay, in, in that class, you know, we actually can implement the solution of the Tower of Hanoi using a processor that only has 256 bytes of RAM and some very simplistic you know, instructions. So I think you know, this may be within the realm of you know, something that can be done. It's about the recursive way of looking at things. You know, so, you know, and you have two weeks to work on this, okay? Yeah, so you know, it's quote unquote plenty of time, okay? And frankly, I don't really care if people use uh, chat GPT to do this homework, because guess what? This is only one part of the 20% of the homework assignment, okay? So in terms of point, it's not that much, okay? And I think, you know, people who use, you know, chat GPT to find the solution, you know, it's just missing a good opportunity to, you know, try to figure out, you know, how to work out algorithms. Which is, uh, which I think is much more important. Oh, I got to tell you guys this one. This is interesting. Okay, to us in a certain, you know, in a certain way, it relates to this class. In, it relates to probabilities and that sort of analysis. <clears throat> I heard about a certain computer security class or cybersecurity class, the class of thirty-one. Okay, it's a class of thirty-one people, so about the same size as this class here. For a discussion, this is a fully online class, so there's a certain discussion portion, and usually discussions carry very few points, okay? We have to do it just because we have to do it. So in a discussion, um, four people out of 31 actually did the work manually. They actually tried to figure out you know, how to use these tools to, and to improve the security of a program and so on. Yes, you heard right. Four out of 31 people actually did the work. The question is, what about the other 27 people? Did they just decide, uh, it's too, too little, not enough point value, I'm just not gonna spend my time to do this. I would totally do that myself. Look at the, just the point value, it's like, 
not worth my time to type in the discussion. I just let go of these points, okay? No, the other 27 people turned in a chat GPT response that had nothing to do with the question itself. And then in one of the other activities, um, 20 people out of 31 answered option A, which is an incorrect choice for one of the questions. And the instructor said, you know, this is something that he had not seen, you know, for years that he had taught this class. So his experience with this class was the average of the first assessment is around 90%, close to 90 percentile. You know, the average of the class is about 90 percent. So you would think that if you have 27 cheaters in the class of 31, then the average would be boosted to say 95 percent. Okay, because you know, they know. Okay, you know who have taken this class before. You know, what what is the key you know, to this particular quiz? No, the average was 40 something percent. It's just strange. Okay. So my suspicion is there is there are certain people, you know, who is collecting money. It's like, hey, you want to get your degree? You know, I can help you with that. You know, just give me a lump sum of, you know, X many dollars, and then I'll help you take this class and get you the certificate that you need. So I think something like that is going on. What I'm interested to really find out is whether someone is working for five, five bucks, you know, for, for an entire day offshore, you know, somewhere, you know, in the rest of the, of the world, or is it done by a bot? Okay. That is my curiosity. It's like, is it done by a bot or are we actually have people being paid minimum wage somewhere offshore doing all this work? Okay. And I got ways to figure that out too. So to me, it's an interesting puzzle to solve. Yes. Oh, I cannot say that just yet. <laughs> but I can say one thing. It has to do with <clears throat> when you load a web page that has images in it. The image, okay, I can give you an example right here. Okay, so just look at this you know, avatar of me, right? So it's just an image from your perspective. But where that image is actually stored or the URL to locate that image, doesn't have to be on this very same website. It can be somewhere else. So that means you know, I can convince the instructor to include an image in the homework description or whatever interface that is used to turn in the work to point to um, an image that is on the server that is under my control. Then I can look at all the traffic. And I can use the time correlation to figure out more or less you know, who is whom you know, which IP address is corresponding to which student, you know, which who turned in the homework, you know, quote unquote homework at what time. So I can start to collect information about, you know, is there a pattern? Are they all coming from the same IP address? Are they interleaved in this way, you know, sequentially, which indicates a person is doing everything? Or are they happening at about the same time, which means a bot is actually doing the work? So, it's, it's always using a VPN, would you be able to know if it was being done offshore by a person? But you need, but in order to hide the identity of the person who is doing it, they cannot use the same VPN connection for all the work, right? Because they have to scatter it. Okay. They have to scatter not only from by the from the perspective of IP addresses, but also from the time you know, stamp perspective. Because I can do a time call relation, it's like, oh, you know, those people all turn in everything within, you know, five seconds. It's like, is it likely that they are actual individual people? No. <clears throat> so there, are, yeah. So it's it's an interesting, you know, puzzle for me to. You know, I look at it as such. All right, but that's kind of interesting. Okay, how you know Chat GPT is being used but not so wisely, you know, in homework assignments. Maybe the four people who turned in real work just uh, prompted ChatGPT to do it. Or maybe those four people just paid more money for someone who actually knows what they're doing to take the classes for them. You should ask the people in my class about Tier, tier one, pay me five bucks and you get your certificate. Tier two, pay me $20 
and I'll make sure that no one will suspect a single thing. And then tier three, pay me a hundred bucks, and I'll make sure that you are, you know, as authentic as it gets. You know, when it comes to it, looks like you know somebody actually did the work. And no, I am not running a business like that. Not yet. And Canvas actually has an API backend too, so that means you know automation can be done, you know, with a certain you know, efficiency as well. So, fun stuff, fun topics. All right, any questions at this point about the homework assignment? So we just spent about an hour to talk about the homework assignment. Yep. In that grade, is homework material the last homework? The last homework. Proof by con. Oh, right. Okay. Yes, we can do that. All right. So let's do that. <clears throat> All right. So we are looking at the CNF or the the one right after the CNF. Resolution and proof by contradiction. All right. So. <clears throat> So it has the solution of the CNF homework assignment that I just you know, kind of quote here. The next phase is to show whether a Boolean expression is a theorem of psi using only resolution and proof by contradiction. The first proposed theorem phi is this, and then the second one, which is phi prime, is that. Okay, so we'll work on you know these you know one by one. I'm gonna use my mouse pad to do the work, you know, just because you know this is easier to type using a an interface like this okay so i can you know, also just copy and paste which is great copy paste okay <clears throat> all right so this is phi itself okay so what is the first thing that i need to do when i am given a general boolean expression as the theorem the proposed theorem yes Negate it first, right? Okay, very good. So we want the negation of phi, which is the negation of what I just you know, pasted here. So I am just going to do it like this, okay? We'll do it step by step. So the first thing I need to do, you know, I typically like to get rid of the implications first, okay? So how you want to do this is up to you. So I'm going to keep the entire thing intact except for the implication. So I just copy and paste change the implication to a or, but I have to remember to negate whatever is on the left-hand side of the implication because that is how implication is defined. So now I look at this and go like, okay, we'll just keep applying De Morgan's Law until De Morgan's Law cannot be applied any further, okay? <clears throat> so there are not really a whole lot of places to apply De Morgan's Law. Um, in fact, there's only one that I can see, which is the uh, negation of um, of the disjunction here. Okay, so the matching of the parentheses is important. So now I end up with um, not not t and the negation of not qt, and then the other side stays exactly the same because I haven't done a single thing with it. So I just copy and paste it over here. Okay, so do we have any questions about this step? It is the application of the Morgan's Law. Did I do it wrong? Isn't there incorrect? Wouldn't you have to apply the negation to the... Yeah, to the other side? Yeah, to the other side. Because it's the negated entirety of that. Oh, you're correct. So this negation... All right, so that means I forgot a, the o, an overall pair of parentheses, you know, because I would need that too. Okay, you're correct. So, yeah, I think it's missing from like uh, your assignment. Though. Well, from the assignment, it doesn't need it. Because phi can be specified exactly the way it is. Uh, it's yeah. just that when you negate it, you have to negate the entire thing. So that means, you know, okay, but you're correct. You know, I did forget about that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, because, you know, the first thing is still get rid, to get rid of the implication, so the implication becomes an or with a negation to the left-hand side. It is this step that needs to be changed. So I would have the negation of the left-hand side of this particular or and the 
negation of whatever is on the other side. Okay, so let me, I'm just trying to evaluate what is the best way to write it. Okay, so I think the best way is still to copy and paste it, change and distribute the negation here, change this um, con disjunction into a conjunction with the negation on the other side. Okay, so that's how we can do this. <clears throat> So that means I have plenty more opportunities to apply the Morgan's law now, because now I have this you know, um, negation of this or, and then I also have this particular negation of, of basically a bunch of ands. You know, this, there's one and here, there's also another and over here. <clears throat> so one thing at a time. So I will, copy and paste it, and then apply the Morgan's Law. So I distribute this negation to the inside, which means I have to negate both sides of the disjunction, and then turn the disjunction into a conjunction. Are we good so far? All right. So for those of you who prefer to do simplifications as you go, you can always look at the double exclamation point and just get rid of the double you know, exclamations, but I'm not going to do it like that. Okay, so I'll do it in some... Uh, later on. All right, so this time we have a negation of and, and, you know, and then this you know, thing here. So that means, you know, when I apply the Morgan's Law, I have to negate this, turn this and into or, negate this, and then turn this into or, and then have to negate that as well. So this is the way I prefer to do things, you know, just because, you know, it's easier for me to follow one step to the next. All right, so after this, I can do one simplification step so just to get rid of the double negation here. And there's a double negation here, okay? And then I have another chance to do uh, De Morgan's Law, at least another one, because there's a negation. This negation that is highlighted is applied to the conjunction between log Q, T. So that means you know, I have another um, De Morgan's Law application of De Morgan's Law. So this negation is distributed to not Q and then turn the and into or. Now we have um, finished up you know, all the De Morgan's Law application on the left-hand side. So on the other side, we have this negation of this or over here, and I, I can apply De Morgan's Law here as well. So I can now say, okay, let's distribute this negation to this and that but then we have to turn the or into a regular and. So that is that. And then I have to make sure that the negation is applied to the entire conjunction and not just to the negation of P. So that's why I need extra parentheses in this case. Are we good so far? Okay. So it's kind of tedious, but you know that's kind of the nature of the thing. All right. <clears throat> So I'm not sure whether you guys use an editor or not to help you do the, to do this. Uh, using an editor really kind of helps, you know, just because you know it's easier to get rid of the uh, double negations and it's, it's easier to line up things to compare as well. So on this side, I still have one more chance to apply De Morgan's law because there's this negation of and. So now I can get rid of this outer negation, distribute it to all this stuff here in the inside. And then I go to the next line to do some simplification to get rid of the double negation here. All right. So I have done everything that I can do with uh, De Morgan's Law and also with um, the definition of implication. So now the question is, what can we do at this point? The only thing left to do is distribution. Okay. So now you have to look at this and go like, but which way do we want to do distribution? So the answer to, quite the answer to that question is, since we have a conjunction here, so that means you know, if I turn this side into a CNF and I turn the other side into a CNF, then the conjunction of the two CNFs is going to be its own CNF. So that means I can, I can use a divide and conquer approach. <clears throat> All right, so if I use the divide and conquer approach, I look at this one here and I ask, is that already a CNF? Does that look like a CNF to you? Yes. It is a CNF. 
okay? Because it's a conjunction of disjunctions. So that means you know, this side is already done. This side, on the other hand, does not look like a CNF to me, okay? Because you know, the, first of all, the outermost operation are ORs, okay? And that cannot be a CNF. So that means I would need some kind of distribution, and distribution can start with uh, distribu distributing the not P and then the P or not S or not T. So I would do the distribution first. <clears throat> Okay, so copy and paste. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, I am distributing the not P into each one of these. So this one becomes a not P, P. This becomes not P and not S. This becomes not P, not T. And after the distribution, this goes away, okay? So remember, one step at a time, so I don't do the simplification on the same line. <clears throat> not P and P is guaranteed to be false, but since this is a false inside a disjunction, so, so that means the false is not needed, so that means I can eliminate this entirely and only be left with that portion. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay, all right. So now we look at the right-hand side, and then we ask, is that a CNF? No, it is not a CNF. Um, in fact, what we can do at this point is to use association because all the parentheses can basically go away. But before we do that, let me see what else we can do here. I'm just trying to see whether factoring is worth doing or not. Okay, all right. So let's do it in a brute force way, okay? So to do it in a brute force way, we look at <clears throat> the, the, the outermost operation, which are the ORs, but then we look at this thing here, it is also really just an OR. So that means you know, all of these parentheses here are not needed because of the rule of association. So all of those parentheses can kind of go away. So this can go away, and then I can remove two additional ones over here. So now we have something that looks like that, which is definitely not CNF. In fact, this is the opposite of a CNF, which is a DNF. It is a disjunctive normal form where we have a disjunction of conjunctions, okay? <clears throat> So the question now is, what do we do at this point? We have the opposite of a CNF. So we look at this and go like, well, we can always do it one step at a time. We look at <clears throat> not Q or R as one thing, and then we look at this little disjunction with not P and not S. So we can do distribution with only just this portion first, and then we'll do the other one later on. Okay, so let me just remind you guys of what distribution we are talking about. So we are, locked, we are talking about A or B and C. This does not work in normal algebra, okay? But in Boolean algebra, you can turn this into A or B and A or C. Is that okay? <clears throat> so remember, this is not a distribution that works in normal algebra, but in Boolean algebra, it does work. So now we go back to this one here, and then we just say, okay, we'll distribute the or P to not Q or R, and then we'll also have not Q or R uh, or not S over here. So the way we can do this is, okay, I can see how to do it. So we just copy and paste what is considered A in this case to over here. And then we group things like this, okay? So we just put a group over here, and then we put a group over here. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here to make sure everybody is following what steps I have taken. So I am looking at not Q or R as variable A here. I'm looking at not P as B over here, and I'm looking at not S as 
uh, C over here. So by using distribution in this particular way, not Q or R, which is basically A, can be ORed with the not P, and the not Q or R can also be ORed with the not S, but then I need to use a conjunction to connect between these two. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay. All right. So the way I usually do things is I want to preserve, you know, the um, alphabetical order just because, you know, this makes it easier later on to find stuff. So Q, R, S is already in the right order. Okay. So now, okay. Can someone tell me what we should do next? Okay, so we have a CNF already over here. Now, the problem with that approach, we cannot just do that. Um, let's see. Yeah, we can do that, and then you know, we, we apply it. Okay, so we can do that, do it like that. All right. So now we look at not P, not T as our B and C, and then we look at this whole thing. You know, so we can we basically do a FOIL this time. Um, all right, so let's take a look at what a FOIL is going to look like in this case. So if you have A, B plus uh, C, D, then it becomes you know, a FOIL, and it, you end up with A or C, A or D, B or C, and then B or D. The FOIL thing is really a consequence of the usual distribution. It's just that you distribute it twice, okay? You have a nested thing that can be by itself also distributed again. <clears throat> so what does it look like after we do the FOIL in this case? All right, so the FOIL is gonna match up, um, let me see, boop, 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 boop. okay. So we need to duplicate this, okay? So we say copy and so that's A, B, A, B. Okay, so yes. So we need to have two A's, okay, so these there you go, one, two, and then two B's, okay, so here's one B, and duplicate it over here, and then we just have to do the distribution of not P over here, that's our C, and then also to have the not P over here, and then a not T goes to the other one, the alternate. So we have a not T over here, and then have another not T over here. Then we get rid of that. Okay. So the question is, do we have a CNF at this point? The answer is, yeah, we have a CNF now. But if you don't want to spend a lot of time doing the resolution, you might want to simplify this a little bit here. So the question is, mm, can we simplify this? I know that the second one, that first thing in the foil, mm -hmm. uh, the not P or not P would work. Okay, all right. So we apply the simplification so that you know, there's no need to mention not P twice in the OR. Okay, so we get rid of this not P over here. Um, what else can we do to simplify? There's actually quite a bit of simplification that we can do. So anything that contains Q or not T can be simplified out. Um, but we don't have anything that has Q or not T, do we? Say again? Um, but that's factoring, but after you do the factoring, we end up with something that is not uh, a CNF anymore, so we cannot do that. Because after you do the, the factoring, then you end up with an or not T that is outside of the conjunctions. 
So I think that's about all you can do really in terms of the simplification. I oh wait, wait I'm I'm wrong here. Okay. All right. So this one is actually going to imply this one over here. So that means you know, this one is not needed at all. Okay. Yes. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Okay. So there's a one particular rule, you know, and we can prove it by using the truth table. So what it says is if you have a conjunction where A is a independent variable, and then you have A or B in the same conjunction, this entire thing is really just A. B is entirely useless. Okay? Does it make sense now? Does it make sense? So if A is true, then we know A or B is true, then you know, A, it matches just A. Yep. And the thing that the uh, number three in the foil um, is also useless, because that just has next and not that. You mean this one? Yeah. So it has so not. Is our oh, right, because, you know, because, yeah, that makes it help helpful, right? You know, making things are slightly ordered. <clears throat> So it has the same, you know, not P or not Q or something. So that means, you know, this is simplified out. This is also simplified out. And we are only left with that. And there is not much you can do to simplify that. So we'll leave it the way it is. But it is CNF at this point. Hmm? Okay, all right. Um, can you simplify further by distributing P and Q not P? Say that one more time. There's no need to do distribution anymore because we already have a CNF at this point. So you can simplify to, um, so for my work, I do the distribution for, for that part and transfer it to P and Q. So oh, you mean to do this distribution? Yeah. So if you do this distribution, it becomes you know, TQ as one term, and then it has an or uh, with T or not T. That becomes just true. So that whole thing becomes true. So that entire side is true. OK, so let's see whether that is the case or not. So the claim is, if we just look at P and Q or not T, um, this whole thing is going to be true all the time. OK, that's my claim. Regardless of the value of t, is is always going to be true. Is that right? If t is true, then not q, t is false, and then q. Okay, so we have then it depends on q. So q is by itself. What if t is false? If t is false, then the whole thing is guaranteed to be false. So I don't think we can do simplification here. Okay, let let's just take this one out and see. If it can be done, okay? So we have just this sub-expression, and you said you did the distribution on it. So the distribution of this becomes, you know, T and Q, <clears throat> or T and not T. So that becomes, you know, just TQ, because T and not T is a false. So I suppose you can simplify out, you know, to just, you know, TQ in this case. The not T over here is useless. Okay, all right, well, that's fine. But as it is, it is already in CNF. Okay, so what do we do once we have a CNF? <laughs> so we, so what we do is we make a conjunction, make a super CNF, including these two, right? We have to include psi. So we include that. And then we just you know, kind of copy and paste this here. Because this quote unquote super CNF is the conjunction of psi and not phi. In other words, we are combining the negation of the proposed you know, theorem with, with everything that is known to be true. So the question now is can we, what resolution can we do, and when do we stop? When do we say, oh, okay, there's no more resolution possible here? 
So what I'm doing is I'm putting one um, expression on the line. So this way it is easier to look at the resolution. Okay. All right. So tell me what resolution is possible here. Actually, let me see. Can we simplify? No, we cannot. Okay. All right. So the systematic way to do this is really to look at you know, all the not T here and say they can resolve with the T and only with you know, whatever is you know, on the other side left. So now we just say, okay, we got D and not Q. We have not Q or not R. And then we have just Q by itself. We have not Q or R or not S over here. So we can you know, add these four just because you know, T can resolve with anything that has a not T in it. So now we look at this and we say, can we resolve any further? Yeah, there are lots of things that we can resolve further. Um, so we have the not T with this T over here. That becomes Q. Okay, so Q by itself. So we can now focus on everything that has a not Q in it. So we have R or not S. Um, there are lots of things with just not Q, with a not Q in it. So this has a not Q, and when it resolves with just the Q, we have just P left. And then we have not R, because you know, this has not Q in it. So when this resolves with this one, we have just the not R left. Um, R or not S, and then we have this not P or R. Okay, not P or R. And that's about all we can do. Sorry? The R and the not R. Well, we have the not R here. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. So now we can have those resolve to just not P, and then because we have P and also not P, the whole thing resolved to a zero. So now the question is, okay, we resolve to a zero, what does it mean? What is the conclusion? A contradiction is reached, and that means? Proposed theorem is actually implied by the given fact. Yes, yep, there you go. <laughs> well, because it's it's algebra, you know, because you know in the exam there will be questions similar to this, you know, not quite as involved. But this is algebra. And if you don't practice, you know, you cannot do algebra without practicing. This is one of those things where you know, you can be the smartest person in the room, but without practice, without actually going through and applying those rules, you cannot see whether it's applicable and when to apply it. Do you think most people spend less time trying to convert to CNF? Um, converting to CNF is, you mean the first part here? Yeah. I mean, that's just your know, algebra. <laughs> there are many ways to approach this, okay? By the way, you can actually make a truth table out of this whole thing, and from the truth table, you can mechanically derive the CNF. There's a way to do it that way as well. Okay. Um, you can also just look at the truth table. Okay. Okay. Let me give you this. You know, after this whole exercise, you guys will go like, "Why didn't you just tell us that to begin with?" Right? Okay. So we have we have psi already. Okay. Psi looks like this. Okay. Okay. Cool. And then we already have phi already. Okay, this is the proposed you know, theorem phi. So tell me again, what makes phi a theorem of psi? Well, that's already using proof by contradiction. So you know, by very by the very definition of a theorem, what does it mean when I say phi is a theorem of psi? It, it makes use of a single Boolean operator. Not if and only if, you get one half of... Implies. Implies, that's right. Okay. So 
what that means is if you look at psi, which is an expression by itself, right, and you say implies your phi, which is you know, its own expression, don't you think you know, this whole thing, even though psi is kind of complicated on its own and phi is kind of complicated on its own, don't you think this is really just a Boolean expression? Yes, okay. And it involves you know, how many variables? P, Q, R, S, T, five variables, right? So you can generate a 32 row truth table for just this expression. Now, is it gonna be an ugly expression? Yes, it is, okay? And getting that into the spreadsheet is going to be quite an exercise by itself. But what are you looking for? If you look at this entire truth table, what are you looking for? So let's just say, okay, let's just say that we have an entire truth table already done. This expression is one column. What are we looking for in that column? Yeah. Uh, we are looking for an instance where psi is true and psi is false. We're looking for the absence of that, okay? So what we're doing is we're looking for the cases of if psi is true, phi has to be true because that's what, you know, that's what makes phi a theorem. Okay, so that means you know, if psi itself is false, we don't care about those rows, okay? You know, it's like, it doesn't even apply, okay? Because we are saying that psi is given to be true, so if in the truth table, psi itself is false, we don't care. If psi is true, then we need phi to also be true, which means the only thing we don't want to see is when psi is true and phi is false. But that's the only time an implication is false. So that means if I make a truth table out of this expression and every single row is a one, that is also a way to prove that psi is implying phi, which means phi is a theorem of psi. Now, is that going to work you know, for large, complex you know, expressions? It depends, right? Because the size of the truth table is exponential to the number of variables. So when you have five variables, you have, a, you have 32 rows. When you have six variables, you have 64 rows, and so on. So that means you know, when you're dealing with really complex expressions, the truth table itself can be pretty big. But when you use derivation, okay, you know, the way we converted a general expression into a CNF, now, the first time, you know, for you guys, it's the first time you do it, it's, it's quite an exercise, right? You're just to decide, uh, what rule should I apply next? But there are certain things that we know have to be applied. De Morgan's law and the definition of implication. The only time you really have to decide, uh, do we do it this way or the other way, is when you have distributions. Okay, which way am I supposed to do the distribution? And there are ways to automate that process. So that means what I'm trying to say is this entire process here can actually be automated. You can actually write a program to systematically do this. Yep. Why couldn't that be a program? <laughs> <laughs> well, because you know, we are already doing a lot of this you know, in a simplified way because you know, the normal Boolean algebra is even worse because you are not working to a certain goal of you know, I just want to change the format of the expression into a CNF. You're trying to prove that an implication is always true. So that's actually harder than what we are doing here. This is already somewhat mechanical. All right. So given all of this stuff here, okay, this is called first order logic. What does that imply? There's a second order logic, which is predicate calculus. Um, we, I have notes for that, okay? So we, I really want to be able to cover that this semester. So predicate calculus or second order logic is after graphs, it is called um, predicate calculus. And there's a programming language invented around the entire concept of second order logic. Okay, it's called Prolog. Most people do not know what, it, what Prolog is. But it's a really weird programming language. I know we are out of time already today. Um, but hopefully by the end of this semester, we'll be able to kind of play with
predicate calculus a little bit because you can do all kinds of fun stuff with uh, prolog. So that's <clears throat> the solution of the homework assignment. So we are going to talk about big and little o, omega, and theta on Wednesday. So read ahead of me a little bit. There's a lot of terminology involved here. So go ahead and read ahead because you're going to need that. And then we can also talk about the programming thing, you know, if you want to you know, get some ideas of how to get it done. All right. So I'll see all of you on Thursday, on Wednesday. Bye. Okay. Bye. And of course, everything is being recorded just fine today.